Hi. Welcome to my circle. Thank you for having me. For, uh, for everybody who is not maybe familiar with this Anne Hyde Dunsmore, uh, she is the premier fundraiser in the state of California for political and charitable campaigns. You are the founder of Capital Campaigns and the campaign manager for Rescue California, one of the groups behind the Recall Gavin Newsom initiative. Yes. Uh, you are also the president of Angel Force USA, a nonprofit organization that works to raise awareness about suicide. Absolutely. And we're, you're one of my newer friends. Yes. I got to meet you at your home at a charity event for Angel Force, which was amazing. Thank you. And as if I didn't know already, uh, researching you for this interview, wow, powerhouse. You're really amazing at what you do, and you've been doing it for a very long time. Yes. So I'm super excited to have you on. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, so there's so much I want to cover, because there's a lot to cover, um, but let's start with uh, your most recent project, the Recall Gavin Newsom yes. campaign. So when did that start, and what made you decide that that's something that you wanted to get involved in? Well, I've always known that California, um, I'm, I'm very in tune with, with California politically. I've been working here since 19, you know, for, for 42 years, and I've watched the ebb and flow of you know, parties and, and people and uh, multi-generation, multi-generational change. So um, the, the recall itself has actually a longer history than my participation in it. Uh, when I got it, it had already been two, two tries that were unsuccessful. So I got engaged in the third try. And I think the thing that was most impressive was that it was not politically, um, it, it didn't, its origins were not political. It, they were very citizen oriented. And it's long been a frustration of mine to watch politics be uh, the product of politicians, not the citizens. And, and I think the citizens have to take some responsibility for that as well. So I, I'm watching, and the, the groundswell is exactly what this country has always been designed to function on. It's the lifeblood of a democracy. And so I thought, I've got to do this. I've got to see how it works. I've got to listen to that pulse. I've got to see the rhythm and flow, because that truly is why we are blessed here, is because of our own choices and our ability to talk to each other and our ability to reach conclusions. And as a result, our ability to pick people who can represent us as opposed to having representatives tell us how to feel. And I think we've moved away from that. And I think that that's not good for us as individuals and it's not good for us as a state or a nation. So I was very excited about it. And I think that's this is gonna be a very big moment in time for people to study for many years to come. So what are the reasons that you think Governor Newsom should be recalled? I think he's got his head in a dome. I don't think he can hear. I mean, think of a dome as something that uh, is, is literally like wearing a hat over your ears and, and having it be in Sacramento is so far away. California is the largest state in the country. It, it covers a demographic, both geographically and, you know, in human nature that's more diverse than anything else, any place else in this country. You have Northern Californians feel one way, Central Californians feel another way, and Southern California is just on water, right. okay? Uh, and the water wars in California are epic, but very typical of many, many, many other differences uh, in lifestyle that make for a different political point of view, right. um, different needs, different problems. Um, we don't have snow issues down here. Uh, so, you know, Central Valley it needs water. Right. It's, it, it's actually very vital to the entire country. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I think that answers the question, but I'm, I'm, I think that California has a set of issues in its own governance that will always be tricky as a result. So I think- But well, wouldn't any governor face that? Well, yeah, and he does a poor, the poorest job. So what are the top issues? The top issues are homelessness, uh, quality of life, cost of living, uh, you know, environmental issues like raging wildfires, power grid blackouts, uh, droughts, 
uh, things that aren't controllable, but certainly not a surprise. So why are we surprised that and not prepared? Mm-hmm. Um, he's also, you know, he's not policy oriented. He's politi- you know, checking off political boxes. Mm-hmm. There's a big difference. If you have a problem, you need to have a sustainable solution. Uh, this takes planning. It takes attention. It takes uh, understanding. Uh, it takes not just being in Northern California, but understanding your entire state and representing your entire state. He didn't start coming down to Southern California until the recall became a probability. Mm-hmm. Los Angeles is a huge uh, challenge for him. Um, Orange County is going to be a huge challenge for him. Southern California is a huge challenge for him. So it's not surprising that his first uh, uh, offensive move, when I say offensive, I'm not using it. I mean, we are offended in Southern California by his decision to close our beaches. That was my first indication that we had a really big problem with a very important person at the helm of the state. He randomly chose to close the beaches in Orange County as a punitive measure against our board of supervisors for and other uh, county elected officials and city officials for not supporting his plan when he had never even consulted in, with anybody on what's best for you. You can't make a set of regulations for one county and expect them to be a perfect fit for another county. You can't even do that at the molecular level of a city versus another city. He doesn't seem to know that. Yet this is a man that was a mayor. Uh, he should know better. Um, so it was no, it should have been no surprise to him that there was a revolt and that people didn't take kindly to uh, his, his leadership style and lack of interest. He became um, a dictator, not a representative. First sign I saw was when surfers, who probably don't vote very often, um, they they uh, were had signs recall Newsom on their surfboards, and I thought, oh, now he has a problem. <laughs> so I want to harness that and and get to the root of the problem and get to the root of the solution. And I'm, I want to see. I want to make that happen. So, so long answer. And all of those things that I listed, by the way, were pre-COVID. We had a homeless issue. We were we were the worst uh, ranked state nationally for the homeless problem. Jobless rates worse than the nation. Uh, cost of living worse than the nation. Uh, education bottom of the barrel. Um, we had a lot of right, taxation. Our taxes highest in the nation. So we had all these problems before COVID. What COVID did was it put him in a fishbowl, and he failed miserably at every turn. He lied outright lied. So now we have a governor that even if he did tell us he has a solution, we can't believe him. And he lies over and over again. So, you know, now that's what I think COVID did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with previous uh, recall initiatives failing um, to qualify, you guys were able to be successful mm-hmm. with one of the largest signature gathering campaigns in the state of California history. Um, what did you guys do differently and how were you able to achieve that? Well, it was the largest in U.S. history. Um, and it was also the largest volunteer driven, uh, signature collection effort in U.S. history. Um, so 2.1 million signatures were turned in. We needed to have, uh, 1.495 million valid signatures. Um, we ended up having, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1.75 valid, 5 million uh, valid signatures. So it was an epic, um, effort. Uh, what did we do differently? We didn't really do anything differently. In 2003, um, we had a recall, successful one. By the way, I just, you know, there is every single time a recall has qualified for the ballot, it's won. Always. Uh, has it been a lot? No, but, but when they've qualified, the recall has gone. Through. So what was the last recall that was? 2003. Statewide, it was the 2003 recall of Gray Davis. Okay. Prior to that, there was the recall of, of uh, Supreme Court Justice Rose Byrd. Um, we've had local recalls, uh, one of Josh Newman that also was successful in the state Senate, I believe. Um, so what we did, same problem in 2003, it was a very organic movement. It was a volunteer driven movement, but they, they always want to say, we're not going to bring in consultants. We're not going to bring in the, you know, the bad guys. Um, we're not going to make it political. This is a citizen movement. 
uh, and then they fail. Uh, because there are so many regulations, there are so many uh, elements to the trade, if you will, that it's like saying, I'm not going to bring in a farmer, I'm just going to have a garden. That's complicated. Right. Um, the, in, the intra-campaign bickering, fighting, and it, you know, all comes from a lack of direction, uh, a lack of knowing what your limits are, a, a lack of knowing what your, your compliance issues are. California is overly regulated, uh, or very regulated, I don't know if it's overly regulated, but it's very regulated politically. And it can really, you could spend an entire, uh, your entire time frame just dealing with the legalities and getting yourself up to your eyeballs on fines. Um, so what we did was the same thing that happened. Rescue California was actually the name of the committee that came in and did the same thing we're doing. I worked on the 2003 campaign as well. So 2003, you had an, a very organic volunteer movement started in the Central Valley uh, with Ty Costa. And then they, um, they really needed some overhead support. They needed to be able to raise the money to actually get out there and get the votes. So Daryl Issa came in with Rescue California and pretty much funded the, the uh, final batch of signatures, if you will, and, and the rest is history. Um, he put his own money in, we raised money, we got a lot of signatures through the mail. Uh, we also funded, paid for signatures, uh, more than, than we did now. So what we did was- so what we, does that mean, paid for signatures? Okay, so the volunteers go get the signatures and they don't charge anybody per signature, okay? There are companies out there that will go gather signatures and then you pay them five, seven, ten, fifteen dollars a signature mm. per valid signature. That could take well, our campaign was about between the original petitioners campaign Res recall gap in twenty twenty and rescue California. I think we spent four million dollars. Mm. Uh, that's unheard of. That's very low mm -hmm. for a statewide effort. Um, but if you add it into that, gathering a million signatures at 10 bucks a signature, you're talking about a $15 million campaign. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really have to do that. Um, I think the volunteer, we, Rescue California uh, basically went into the mail to all registered Republican households. And then as we got more money, we went into, you know, no party preference and so forth. Um, and uh, we raised money through that mailing as well. So, I mean, really kind of was a very efficient mechanism. We did it in 2003. Um, but in 2003, they went in and had to do massive uh, paid signature gathering. Mm -hmm. We only went in at the very last minute just to make absolutely certain um, and got a couple hundred thousand signatures um, paid. I think it's because you're a woman that you knew to do that. <laughs> we are very detailed oriented. Yes. Um, well, actually, our campaign manager, uh, not campaign manager, but one of our general consultants, you know, was just like developing hives of the fact <laughs> that we weren't getting paid signatures. And I was like, okay, we'll dedicate. But, you know, we did, we ended up spending seven, I had to increase the budget at the last minute by $750,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's serious, that's serious change. Yeah. I mean, it's not even, I can't necessarily say, oh, yes, so I'll done. look at that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so we ended up the signature gathering with a little bit of debt, but. Um, it, it was a great effort, and we did it. We did our job. Yeah. So here's what the opposition would say: California has now one of the lowest COVID rates. We're now we're ranked 34. I checked yesterday. We're ranked 34 out of 50 states. Schools and businesses are now open, and when the signatures were being collected, a big part of it was the mishandling of COVID. Um, and the normal primary election is now only 17 months away. Does it make sense for California to spend the 80 to 100 million that it'll cost the state to recall a governor that you know could be voted out in 17 months already? Well, first of all, um, uh, California is a 250 billion dollar enterprise. This man uh, has lost 35 billion dollars in in uh, jobless benefits that have been distributed to criminals in in in, in jobless benefit fraud. Okay, 35 billion fails to talk about it. It's all over. Everybody else knows about it. He won't address it. Um, we have jobless claims that still have yet to be paid from last year. People who actually were working and not sitting in prisons. That $35 billion is also 
already proven to be regenerating itself in the form of guns and, and criminal increased criminal activity on the street while we're defunding police, supposedly, uh, and letting out 76,000 prisoners. At which point, if you were running a $250 billion company and somebody was throwing money away like Pez, uh, would you say, I think we need to find somebody else? Well, let's just wait for the regularly scheduled election. Um, right now, he's offered up the largest vaccine lottery <laughs> fund and the first reaction of the people on the street, that's not his money. That's our money. You start looking at the service, uh, SEIU, largest uh, government employee union in the state, going, wait a second, he lied to us when we went to negotiate our pay raises last year because he told us we had a budget deficit and he couldn't afford to pay us. Now he's throwing money at a, va at a COVID vaccine lottery. Uh, now he's lost $35 billion. Now he's bragging about a $76 billion, I'm sorry, $35 billion, uh, $76 billion surplus. And what was their reaction? We're gonna get his ass out of office. Now they've never supported Republicans. Um, so I say, uh, it couldn't happen soon enough and we better cut our losses. And if it's only 50 to $100 million, I say that pales in comparison to the mistakes that he's made. He introduced a $2 billion uh, fix. And by, the, by the way, the schools aren't reopened. He said they will be reopened. He's done that January, February, March, April, May, now June 15th. Which, by the way, everybody's out of school June 15th, so I'm glad he's going to reopen the schools on June 15th because you're going to be closed on June 15th because that's the schedule. It remains to be seen whether or not he will be reopening the schools in September if there's going to be a resurgence. Um, he never opened them fully. We were at the lowest rung on the ladder as far as the percentage of students that were back in school. But I want to go back to the $2 billion program that he did uh, propose without consulting with the largest union in the state, which is United Teachers of Los Angeles, UTLA, who then came out and said, he never talked to us. This isn't what we need, this $2 billion. That's his political checkbox. They called his plan, $2 billion plan then, structural racism. They said that. Now, for an organization to say something like that, it can be later used against the governor of their party choice. The teacher unions have never gone Republican. Um, of, that they said that about Gavin Newsom will most certainly find its way into TV and radio commercials and printed campaign materials on behalf of the recall. Uh, that was a calculated risk. Same with the we are going to get his ass out of office by SEIU. That's calculated risk. Um, is that something that I would do to, to uh, the governor if I want to negotiate a pay increase? I don't think so. So my, my point is, is that um, I don't think there's a day too soon to get rid of somebody who's misappropriating money, who doesn't have their thumb, nor does he care to have his thumb on the pulse of what's hurting people desperately and deeply with the promise of continuing to do it by having selective drought conditions declared an emergency in some counties and not others. Uh, we have a pending problem here that's going to be a drought that turns into a famine. Um, and that buzz is already reaching a pitch. Why is he talking about having the elections in August? He's doing it as a big risk because you have bills signing in October. You have bills finishing in August for presentation in September for him to sign. He has 30 days to do it. He's running a risk of having somebody else in office signing or not signing those bills. So, you know, November, December, why not? Because he thinks that the bleeding isn't going to stop, that he's going to continue to have people have problems. He will. He already does. That are going to drive his numbers down, down, down. He's at 52% job approval rating. That's not a reason for a happy dance. 60% or higher is where you want to be on approval if you're an incumbent at any level. If you sink below that, you have a target on your back. If he gets into the 40s, we haven't even started campaigning against him. He's been the one drawing all the heat, right? Once we get him below 40, it's an open invitation to other Democrats to run that he's been bullying openly. You don't, if, if a Democrat runs this at the state party, the Democrat runs, you'll never work in this town again, ask Cruz Bustamante. Whoa, 
so much for the dem democratic process. You're openly bullying people in your own party. Christine Pelosi, Democrat Party State Party Convention, says to the floor at the convention, if you, and takes it to a vote, if we as a party continue to tab the recall movement as racism, Trumpism, and a Republican power grab, we're going to lose. She took it to a vote and lost because they want to keep going down that road. So by her definition, they're going to lose with that message. So I say, bring it on, bring it on tomorrow, because you don't know how people are feeling. Your pollster isn't asking questions the way they need to be asked in order to measure the level of discontent, unrest, and civil disruption that has been caused, emotional disruption that has been caused. UCLA, I'm finished with this. UCLA did a poll um, just in LA County seven of, of parents of school-aged children. 76% of those parents said that their children had been seriously damaged emotionally and academically by the flip-flopping of the back-to-school policy. That's the kind of number we look at and we know that's true. They wanna go take a poll where it looks like Pollyanna poll, where, you know, oh no, he's not beatable. He's, he's, he's the strongest governor in the country. This is the best place to do business. His words, not mine. Uh, this is the best place to have a business. This is the place, best place to live. It's like, no, statistically, none of that's true. So I just, I just say to all of that, keep spinning it. Keep spinning it. And, and if you believe it's true, you're going to lose. If it's not true, why are you saying it? Because you need people to believe that you're the bully that has no muscle. You don't, not up here and not anywhere because that's just all you know, politics and bullying. And that's what's gotten you where you are now. So that's my answer, sorry. <laughs> that's a good answer, that's a good long answer. <laughs> sorry. So if the recall is successful, I mean, who do you think is capable of taking on the inordinate task or job of running a state with almost 40 million people in it? Um, you know, there are a lot of qualified people running. 66 people have uh, already, uh, have already filed. 66? 66. In 2003, there were 135. Yeah. Um, Arnold came along, and, and people forget, we had some very, very qualified people running in 2003. We had icons like Peter Ubroth. We had uh, Daryl Issa. We had Dick Reardon, who was one of the most popular mayors, um, and very much in the middle, you know. Um, and you had... Uh, you had a number of congressional members. I think one actually stayed in, so it wasn't just Arnold. Uh, but now you have, you know, and everybody's going to have a difference of opinion. Um, Breast California is a primarily formed committee. We're not allowed to advocate for candidates. Uh, we can advocate for a yes vote on recall, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I will go so far as to say that I do believe that whoever wins is going to win with 10 to 20 percent of the vote. Uh, we have 20 million registered voters in the state of California. You have to assume somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of them will turn out. So 12 to 14 million people will turn out. Um, and the yes vote is going to need 50 percent plus one, so six to seven million plus one. Um, and a candidate could, in fact, win with one or two million votes. Arnold won with 3.2 million votes. So... Um, no party preference is, is one of the leading non-party parties. It's, it's one of the, it is the largest, it's over Republicans. It goes back and forth. Republicans are either second or third, but no party preference is always in second. Most of the time these days. And what does that mean? They don't want to be told what to do by a party. They, they've made a conscious decision not to be part of a party infrastructure, which is a whole nother discussion about America heading into a post-partisan era, which I do believe we're headed into, a yeah. recalibration. I would love that. I think, I think that most people would. That would do very well for yeah. the country. Yeah, I think it, most people want to see what's somebody's moral compass. We're not going to agree with everybody all the time, but if we know that they're making a decision from a good place uh, and an honest place and that they've done their homework and they're making the best decision that they can, that's one thing. But lying, uh, not even asking, uh, not even caring, uh, just having his eye on a presidential ball, that's never going to work for people again, ever, ever. There's no self-serving candidates. We don't need martyrs, but we definitely need uh, people who are qualified, who've been on both sides of a paycheck, 
Um, and I think we have that. I think we have a handful of people like that. And now you have to decide whether or not they're morally qualified. Mm-hmm. Well, that leads us into um, the conversation about some of the other candidates you, you've worked with because you've worked with many of the GOP presidential candidates as yeah. well. You've worked with uh, both George Bush and George W. Bush, Bob Dole, Ronald Reagan, Pete Wilson, Mitt Romney. Um, did you work on the Trump campaign? No. Um, I got, I kind of got burned out. I, I, I really wanted to take my expertise down to the level of bench building, if you will, and really work hard. Fundraising is one of the most complicated, emotionally complicated things to get people to engage in. Um, uh, so I just felt like it was better to go down that road. I've also just graduated into management. I've been in the business for 42 years. So it's like, well, you know, I, I've been doing this since most of our candidates were born. And so as a result, and even the people who manage them. So sometimes it's just like, yeah, we have to have a cash flow. I mean, today's, today's you know, millennials and 20s and 30-year-olds don't even have a balance checkbook. They just go do it electronically. Uh, so developing uh, strategic measures using tools of old is sort of a complicated process. So... Everything affects fundraising. So as a result, I end up having to be engaged in all of it. So by the time the Trump campaign came along, I had already worked on 15 different presidential campaigns. And I include in that the efforts of the national committees who become de facto presidential campaign committees when the party eventually nominates somebody. Um, And that's really stressful. I I loved working with Mike Huckabee. I mean, in one year, I worked with Giuliani in one year. I was still dealing with the presidential uh, financial responsibilities of the RNC and the Bush administration. Um, and then I also was, you know, I first signed on with Mitt Romney, then I signed on with um, Rudy Giuliani, then I signed on, you know, I was just like, ugh, you know, this, none of this works for me, I don't. Would you, you know. like to see Mitt Romney run again? No. He's a good man. Um, he's, he's I think he deserves to be who he wants to be politically uh, at this point in his life. And I don't know how electable that is on a national level. Mm -hmm. I think he'll always have an impact. um, And I think he's the type of person who, I don't know, I can't speak for him. But I think he's at a point where he probably wants it to be pure myth Mm -hmm. and not this hybrid that we're all forced to have to be when you're trying to get enough votes to win. Mm -hmm. Would you like to work on a, a presidential campaign again? I'd like to work for somebody that would be qualified to to enter into a new age of understanding what that looks like. Uh, I don't know that that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Not in my lifetime. Really? No. I just, it, it, there's a lot of clutter. I think you have to sort of deconstruct the entire two-party system uh, and it's credit, make the parties uh, as transparent as we are now capable of making the candidates. And I don't think people understand the headquarter mentality of the two party strips of, of, a, of a, a party, a political party, whether it's at the national level or the state level or the county level, it's nobody sees the inner workings of that and any of the branches that come out of that. Um, it's poisonous. It's as bad, if not worse, than the uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely concept that you would apply to people who are in a dome. Uh, there's another dome down the street, and, and that one's just as manipulative and tone deaf as what you end up seeing in the Capitol. So it's no surprise <laughs> that the farmer uh, of the candidates uh, and the nourishment whether that's positive or negative, is producing what's going over here. Um, so that's got to kind of deconstruct, and I don't know if there's enough time. Would I want to participate in that? No question about it. I, my favorite T-shirt, my favorite T-shirt in the whole world, I know you want to know what book it is, but the T-shirt says disruptor. <laughs> and not to no end. Not here to just throw a lot of stuff up in the air and have it go homeless. I mean, it would be disruption, mm-hmm. honest, um, pure of heart disruption. Do you think that there's other people in the GOP that would support that way of thinking? 
I think there have been some lame attempts. I think there's been angry attempts. Uh, I think an attempt to disrupt has to be calm, uh, purposeful, with every best intention, every ounce of humanity that we can muster. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, the political machines are money-generating entities. I have to make a living. I support my family three generations now as much as I can, uh, four. Um, and so I do have to make a living. And, um, and so do they. However, when money is the reason you do something, it loses its value, both money and the project. So there's a lot of work to be done there, man. I got to say, that's the next frontier for me. Mm -hmm. Now, if that can end up producing an incredible candidate for president, I would be blessed to have that in my lifetime. Do you see anybody coming up the ranks that you think would be a cool potential Republican presidential candidate? You know, I do, but uh, I think what interrupted, the reason I hesitate is if you had asked me that before all the vitriol of the last four years, I would have said yes. Now I've, I've seen people succumb to the anger um, and the frustration and going a little overboard uh, aggressively so that problem solving and partisanship are at risk, are put everything at risk. So I think Dan Crenshaw has a huge future. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, Crenshaw. Dan Crenshaw is a Navy SEAL who um, is a great guy, super smart, super loving. Um, and I think his public persona is very aggressive. Um, and, and he's incredibly well-spoken. He, um, he won a primary. I, I remember when he said I'm gonna run, I was like, don't do that, you're such a good guy. <laughs> and, and he beat all these Republican billionaires, and he, uh, he, he, he won the primary, and all of a sudden he was everybody's, you know, candidate, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but I think Dan has strong potential to sort of stop the madness and, and grab hands over the, across the aisle and say, no, we got to save the village. Um, and it doesn't matter if uh, we disagree on anything other than saving the village. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we need to see. Yeah. And I don't know that there are a lot of people out there. They like taking sides or they're forced to take sides with leadership that doesn't deserve to be in a leadership position. I, don't, I think it's time for Nancy Pelosi to go away. I think it's time for, you know, Chuck Schumer to go away. I am sorry that AOC has decided to go the course that she's going because I think she could have had value in, in bringing people more to the center. Um, but she's so progressive and so to the left that it's just like, okay, we, we, don't, need, we don't need all that upset right now. I think, I think, you know, Mitch McConnell should be applauded for the work that he's done. I think he should consider, you know, uh, making sure that there's a new time and a new age and, and, and a new direction. Um, but, you know, I don't pull all those strings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Uh, so as if being a political powerhouse isn't enough, you're <laughs> also a huge heavy hitter in charitable contributions. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so let me read off some of these because they're, they're numerous. Uh, Director of Development for UCLA Medical Services. Medical Sciences, yeah. Medical Sciences. That's the glasses part. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <you wanna go. laughs> Averaging over $180 million a year, which is really unbelievable. Manages staff of over 30 people. Raised $1.2 billion to build two new hospitals as well as medical, academic, and research facilities. And you also spearheaded the naming concept as well as the funding strategy for the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center and consulted on the David Geffen School of Medicine. Yeah. So how did you get involved <laughs> with UCLA? And it's very different probably than the type of work that you did in politics, I would imagine. Yeah, well, no. I mean, politics is a great training ground because you don't have years to do something. You know, you, somebody says, I'm going to run for office. You have like eight months to or a year at most to sort of design, implement, and, and finish uh, a, a, an effort. Uh, the UCLA thing was really cool. Um, uh, Michael Lovitz, uh was, uh, and Ron Burkle were chairing, co-chairing the capital campaign. Uh, we had had the Northridge earthquake and everybody was under a mandate to either uh, rebuild or retrofit um, the hospitals in the LA County area. And so they had decided to rebuild the 
the UCLA Medical Center. And, and Michael had gone and procured IM Pay, it's, you know, busy architect with the Louvre and just brilliantly um, historic, to, to build a new age hospital. Um, and they were really having trouble. Um, you have a lot of competition in, in, in LA on, on, on raising money for medicine. So I came in and Michael, Michael uh, called me up and said that we had a mutual friend who had suggested, well, you know, you've got to handle on all the Democrat donors in Los Angeles, but you've got to get a Republican one, you better call Ann Dunsmore. So uh, Michael and I met, and I guess I must have passed muster because then he introduced me the, to the dean and provost. So at the time, Dr. Jerry Levy was in charge of both the hospital and the medical school. And they were really designing a total overhaul. Uh, they wanted to become the best in the West at the very least. Um, and they had the real estate to do it. They had the patient base to do it. They, you know, they had the emergency room to do it because that's where you really get some of your finest training if you're, you know, go on to a specialty. Anyway, so this great thing. And I said, okay, well, I know what the solution is. <laughs> this is really funny, actually. I know what the solution is. Let's name it. Uh, let's see. I was very close to the Ronald Reagan uh, uh, um, Library was in the process of being uh, uh, completed. And the president was already headed into, you know, the, the sad void of, of Alzheimer's. And Mrs. Reagan was like really hammering phones. And I knew, and I thought, God, she needs a rest. I mean, that's just an awful thing for her to be doing. And, you know, they were going to be buried there. Um, and I thought she's, she's terrified that, that, you know, it's going to become the garbage barge of, you know, the two mm thousands -hmm. where they're, you know, could be moving around uh, all over the place. So um, I said, let me, let me make a phone call and see if I, ca I called to say, what's your heartburn number? And a very good friend of mine was um, um, head of that. And I said, what's your heartburn number over there? And they said, about 50, 50 million. And I was like, okay. And the rebuild of the Ronald Reagan was going to be about 130. And I thought, well, you know, and I, I went to Jerry Parencio's Rest in Peace, one of the most amazing men in philanthropy ever. Um, and I said, and he was their neighbor, and I said, you know, if we can get them 50, then maybe they'll let us use the name and we can name the hospital the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. And I'll never forget, he goes, Ann, do you know the difference between 130 million and 180 million? And I said, no, and he goes, nothing. <laughs> so all we have to do is sit down and get it done. So we actually got about 180 million, and then about $150 million in commitments. And I knew one thing about Jerry. I knew that if we ran short of gold, he'd write a check for the balance. You know, mm -hmm. that's what you just want. I have other stories like that uh, too, uh, but uh, we ended up raising, really getting it done in a convincingly way, I would say, in 90 days. Oh, um, my I mean, gosh. When you come up with a good idea, it doesn't take much. You just have to do it, get on it, be it, own it. Well, we do a little thing here called Big Questions. Mm -hmm. So I've got some big questions because I, I listen to you and I think, uh, how do you, where do you get the strength? Where do you get the, you know, the time? I mean, you work on so many things and you do them all so incredibly well. Give us a hint about what your daily routines are about. What I do is I, I wake up, you know, somewhere around five, six o'clock. I always look at my emails and decide whether or not I can go back to sleep for an hour. Um, and I can. Um, then I'll go get my coffee and my, my gluten-free bagel. And then I, you know, I've got my OCD thing going. And yet now I know that after that is anybody's game. Um, and, you know, taking on the responsibility of being a spokesperson for something like the recall is, is sort of new. Um, I'm not a stranger to, to um, speaking uh, on behalf of uh, a project, but not like this, mm -hmm. you know, it's like- It's a daily- It's, you know, a reporter will call up and say, can we do a Zoom interview with you? And it's like, oh, I didn't wash my hair and I don't have any makeup <laughs> on and I have a, an old t-shirt on, but that's okay because I knew this was gonna happen and I have, Give me 15 minutes. So, <laughs> so, and you're my first female guest. And so far, you're the first guest to, to even bring that to light, which is so true, right? As girls, we can't just sometimes jump on the phone in 15 minutes. We need a little bit more time. I know how to put my makeup on really fast. And I've got a, a, a real fast go-to hairdo. So 
And I also know that nobody can see the back of my head. So, um, so that's how, so I try to pace myself and I try to decompress when I know I can. So a lot of times I'll just, um, this is going to sound crazy. I'll like watch a BBC show, a few episodes in the morning. And I'll just sort of float through the morning and I'll deal with very tense situations. And then I know I am back on nonstop until probably seven or eight o'clock at night, sometimes not until 10.30. And you can't, you can't just sit down at a desk and, and do that. I can, but not day after day. And my weeks are also not five day weeks or seven day weeks. Um, and how do you take time for yourself though? How do you get that rest that you need? How do you, how do you refuel? When I rest, I rest. Like I stay in bed. You can't. Now I also do, I have decided to carve out. I have a lot of sports injuries and stuff like that. And, and when you have back pain or hip pain or knee pain or, you know, that kind of thing, then you really, really do need to be careful about your, your physical strength. And so I work out three days a week. I don't overdo it. I don't try to beat any, you know, I'm happy to engage gracefully. Um, but I also do manual stretching um, because I am in a chair. I also try to get up and walk around when I'm on a conference call. I do it on my cell phone. Mm-hmm. I'll go outside. Um, I'll pace and I can do laps in my courtyard at work. Uh, I can do laps in my office. Um, and, uh, but when I rest, I really go to stupid land. I, I go to either stupid land, fantasy land, you know, like, you know, uh, PBS episodes of whatever. Yeah. I think, what am I now on? Lark Spur and Candle Rise or Lark Rise and Candle, whatever, <laughs> Candlewood. Um, and, and I pick those out really carefully because that's my, that's my equilibrium. So, and then I, you know, I do sprinkle personal, um, things in during the day and I have no apology for it. I mean, if you catch me doing my nails at 1.30, I'm trying to catch a break. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the I think the toughest thing is making sure that my t- nutrition is um, easily accessible without mm-hmm. getting into big gulps or, oh, I'm going, you know, somebody to walk by my office and say, oh, I'm going over to Burger King, I want something. And you know, your brain and your blood sugar is like tanking and you go, no, but could you stop by the health and storage yeah. center? No. Um, so that's, you know, that's, it's meticulous. It's very, um, something I think about sleep, you know, it's key. Yeah. Um, be one thing to say, I'll be right back in 15 minutes. Let me just throw some makeup on and a nice sweater and, and you know, put my hair up. Uh, it's a whole other thing to say, give me three hours because I got to get rid of the bags under my eyes and it looks like I've just got punched in the <laughs> eyes. You can't do it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a good challenge. Yeah. We should do that in our lives anyway. We gotta take care of ourselves, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Tell me something people would be surprised to know about you. That I'm lazy and I have a lack of self-esteem. <laughs> yeah, I would be surprised to hear yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I believe it, but yeah, okay. it's true. Uh, it's the, the self-esteem issue is, is kind of now something that I, I know it's there, I play with it. It's like my sandbox friend, and uh, then I and I know for survival reasons that it can't be a dominant force. Um, and uh, but it's it's part of who I am, and, and I actually think that it, it it keeps me balanced. I'm a Libra, so I have a lot of things that I keep in place to just keep a little foot on the on the, on the side of the scale that could go like this at a moment's notice. Um, and uh, and that's that. And I also think that I'm an incredible mother. I love my kids to death. I love my you know my grandkids. Um, I'm an, an, an uncommon mother. In what way? Um, I treat I treat all my children and grandchildren as adults from the moment they hit the ground. And uh, and uh, and I and I love them fiercely to a fault. Um, I don't think people, when you, when you're confronted with a woman like me who can arguably has been described to be a man eater, I'm not, I'm, I'm absolutely, boy, give me a guy that just give me a hug every night when I come home. That's all I need. I don't need a whole lot more than that. However, and guys, she's single by the way. Yeah. And it's just, you know, and there's a reason for that. Um, there's a reason. It's not not pretty easy. It's not of my making. But it is because of who I am and nobody, and then people think that they have to compete with this or change it or, um, you know, I don't know all the reasons. Uh, I've been married three times, so it wasn't for lack of trying. I love my husband's. I have a great relationship with him, but 
um, you know, I just need a travel partner in my life. And, mm-hmm. and, and also just, you know, if I, you know, just so far so good. All right. I'm going to take it. <laughs> so tell me some books that have influenced you the most. Um, more towards the middle of my life, self-help time in my life, the way the peaceful warrior was absolutely one of the most foundational books, very easy to understand. It was, it felt like it was me. Um, and the Bible, of course, I'm, I'm not overtly religious. I'm very private. You know, I, I, I've told you before that, you know, I, I learn these things and then I practice them on my own time. I know I'm not an evangelist. Um, but I, I know I viewed it as an incredibly important historical document uh, because you could look at something that was written thousands of years ago and have it be absolutely relevant today. That's wisdom. Mm-hmm. And I love that. And, and there's no amount of wisdom that has ever meant anything over a long period of time that's been complicated. It's been very human. It's been very simple. It's very in your face. It's very, it's not disruptive. Um, it's can be eye opening if you've had your eyes closed, but it's soothing. So, so the Bible, the way of the peaceful warrior, and the children's garden of verses are kind of my good stuff. Yeah, I can remember them. I'll remember them all my life. Tell me, what do you think is the, the biggest issue facing the world today? Recalibrating our humanity. Um, Getting, you know, the information age is so important, but it's dehumanizing. Um, Our children don't know how to talk to each other. They don't know how to be in a community. We've taken them away. Um, I think the basic tenets of humanity are, um, require presence. Um, And, you know, I think there's so many things that are good about the information age, But on the other hand, we need to know when to stop for an hour or two hours or five hours or just take that day where, you you know, if you pick a day where you're not going to eat pasta, pick a day where you're not going to use your phone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's about being healthy. Mm -hmm. It's about allowing your brain not to be programmed and and constantly taking in so much that you can't even think for yourself because you're still processing what's coming at you. Just try it sometimes. Put your hand up and just... I'm going to go, I'm going to just sit, I'm going to look at the flowers out in your yard, which is, by the way, has had a hummingbird in it, not <laughs> the entire time I've been here, which means that you're blessed by somebody in, the, you know, in your history is coming Yay. back to visit. You know, that's my father, he does that. Um, but that's the kind of thing, and again, I get it. Look, I, I, I can hyperventilate through a day and collapse and feel like I had no meaning. Um, and, I'm, and, and I'm just not going to do that anymore. Um, and I'm not going to deal with anybody in a judgmental way. If they have no calories for my life, for my soul, they can be in my life, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I'm not, you know, life is a little bit of a basket. You can only put so much in it, but you can have a bigger basket and a bigger basket and you choose to do that. Otherwise, shit starts, sorry, it's falling out. You know, stuff just falls out of your basket if you're not careful. And it could be valuable. So be careful about what you put in, especially at my age. You know what I mean? Children should take incoming for as long as they can, uh, but not in a scary way. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my, um, that's kind of my philosophy on you know, this point. Tell me something you used to believe, but you don't anymore. Santa Claus? <laughs> <laughs> you don't um, believe in Santa Claus? I believe in Santa Claus. I just... I'm kind of kidding. I actually do think that that's probably rooted in a lot of actual fact. But, um, you know, what it, do I don't believe in anymore? I would have said you don't get something for nothing, but boy, we get a lot for nothing. And that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, I would, I would absolutely change my mind on. You don't get something for nothing. Yeah, you do. Because there's so much here and there's so much that you can learn by being present and opening your mind to everything from the ridiculous to the sublime, to the genius, to the whatever, and you can ignore what you want to, but just um, be a little more open, be be contradictory to yourself, of yourself for just 10 minutes a day. If you say, I think you're talking to my son. Oh, well, (laughs) and as the, as the quote goes, uh, nothing in excess, not even moderation, you know? So, 
balance it as much. And that's the Libra talking, but I believe that that's true. I think everybody's looking for a balance. And, and I've been blessed to sort of be get birthed on a day that made me one big giant scale. So, um, and a woman, I will say that that's a blessing. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. So you are the founder and president of Angel Force USA, a charity that is, uh, I got to go to an event for, and I was so moved by the people that I met there and the stories that I heard there. And I was literally thinking, you know, with your background, you, you could put your time and energy into any cause. I mean, any cause would be super excited to have you. But you've, you've picked the, the suicide awareness or suicide prevention. Why is that? Well, the first thing was, so I did a lot of work in the brain sciences. So, you know, I kind of went from the general schematic of, you know, neurosurgery and, and the neurosciences while I was at UCLA and, and the chairman of the, what then became the department, you know, you go from a division of science to a department and that requires money. So the, the head of neurosurgery said, look, I'm, you know, help me become a department. So that was another thing I did at UCLA. I also worked with the School of Theater, Film and Television too, but... So I said, okay. And my father and a lot of people in my family suffer. Epilepsy is one step away from, you know, all kinds of neurological problems, i.e., you know, schizophrenia, manic depression. You know, a lot of things can get misdiagnosed. All you have is epilepsy and everything's much better. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I decided that, that you know, when, when I went to work for Magali Haas, that's her name, Magali Haas, and she's, she's doing co veterans bioscience and big hail out to her. You want to talk to a a mega woman, that's one right there. Um, and so she was zeroing in a lot of funding from Steve Cohen, whose son was a Marine, um, you know, specifically military. Uh, uh, and and, and the, in my view, that was a brilliant thing to do because if you start with an issue inside of needing to service veterans, you could probably get a lot of attention and a lot of money for mm -hmm. it faster. Mm -hmm. And then you can blow it out into the general population. Suicide is the ultimate uh, decline of, of the human spirit. And I, I, I honestly love that more than anything else. I mean, you could see me laughing like a little girl watching American Idol and just watching somebody try to win um, and just killing it. And just, just from pure human spirit. If I go to watch a football game, this is the Libra in me too. It's like, I don't have a team. I don't have a team. I'm looking to see who's going to have the toughest time winning. And I, and I love watching that journey. I love watching that happen. It's why I like pushing boulders up hills. I want to see if I can do it. Um, <laughs> and so, so that was, that's, that's why I chose, chose suicide. It's very close to my family. It's well, and I read that like one in three veterans contemplate suicide. Like it's a very... Yeah, it's, it's massive. It's, yeah. it's one an hour kills himself. Well, I, even I've been talking two people kill themselves. Two veterans only. So, you know, times that by, I don't even know how much... Uh, so a, a vet a day, a vet an hour, uh, you know, 20, 22 plus two a day. Yeah, not okay. Really it's not okay. And female veterans are 10 times better at it than the men are. When they go to kill themselves, they succeed. And that's military sexual trauma for the most part. Um, and I've worked with these guys. It's tough. It's tough. Uh, and, and so one thing I came to understand is that creativity and music and the arts, whether it's painting, sculpting, writing, um, playing music, composing, just taking your, your buddy, your guitar, and just sitting with it, um, can, can take you out of that black storm in your brain uh, that they're plagued with pretty much 24 seven. I mean, some of these special ops guys come home and what are they doing? They're, they're fighting at night and sleeping during the day. Problem number one, circadian rhythm completely disrupted. They, they sleep standing up uh, in a garbage dumpster um, because that gives them the most protection. Um, they're separated from their family. They have a new family and then they're separated from them to go back to a family they don't know anymore. And they, these guys are all killing themselves one by one. And you might be the pivot point. You might be the guy that they all touch base with. Now you're a caregiver. So that's the other thing that people don't really realize. The caregivers, the, the people at the VA who deal specifically with people at risk for suicide, think about that. How many people are they developing a relationship with that kill themselves? 
It's devastating. We burn them out without even knowing who they are. We don't even recognize when somebody's at risk and all it takes is talking. All it takes is just noticing. All it takes is being a human, taking out that programming we have all day just to be present. So this goes back to all of the other things that I've said are important to me. Being present, being human, adapting to all the gifts that progress gives us, but not forgetting where we came from and where we're going to wind up back again. Well, and you guys use a term suicide which I hadn't heard before. Yeah, well, we agree, but, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. that says it all, right? If yeah. You, 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 and you, that you were telling me that if, if you talk about it, it's some like dramatically less of a percentage of chance that you... Somebody tells you they want to commit suicide, the chances are very slim, slimmer than if they just were going to do it. Now that, so that tells you exactly why we have to mobilize the artist community in a broad way to, to engage in this particular topic. Um, teen suicide is huge. I, by drawing attention to this through a military specific uh, mm -hmm. um, project doesn't mean that we don't have every intention. Death by overdose is, you know, suicide by cop, you know, I mean, that's, these are very real things. So Jim Cregan, who was Rod Stewart's lead guitarist for 20 years, wrote great hits, one of my best friends uh, in, my, in my lifetime, one of the most rewarding friendships I've ever had. Um, you know, I called him up, I said, I really want to do this thing, but I can't do it without you. You're across the pond, you, you, your family, your kids are here, your granddaughter's here, not at the time, but now. And can you do this with me? Great pan on the East, um, in, in England, and he goes, absolutely. So he came over, And one morning, I'll never forget, I was living in Emerald Bay at the time, and I come upstairs, and there's Jim creating a little video with the word suicide just sort of written on two different pieces of paper, and he's moving them on the thing, and he's creating a little video, and he's got it all down. What is suicide It's a word that Jim Cregan created to describe the avoidance of discussion about suicide. And if we stop suicide so those are all the little pieces of paper, stop suicide He went on here, we have Penny Stewart, Rod and Penny Stewart holding up the sign, we have Ronnie Wood holding up the sign, Stop Suicide, and Graham Nash. You know, if everybody just sort of did that, you know, people would be, what's suicide? Mm -hmm. Like, it's a great word, it totally describes us, want to get it into the Oxford English Dictionary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it may sound simple, but it, sometimes it's all it takes. Mm -hmm. So we go out and sing, they create music for it, they... You, you push in some incredible talent into your uh, to your events, and I remember when I was looking at your board, I couldn't believe it how many you know professional musicians you have. Like, how did what made you decide that music was going to be your? Was it because of your relationship with Jim or? No, you know I've always known. Well, look, I've always I've always seen well, what happened with Live Aid. How did how did the stigma about AIDS just get slapped right down on our dinner table? Right. How did um, polio, by the way, if you go all the way back to getting troops ready for diseases that they're going to get during World War II, was Dr. Seuss and Walt Disney. You know, so, you know, how, how is, there's a great argument to be made that, that movies actually pushes science. You know, that spaceships actually were created by a cartoonist. Not a scientist, but a scientist actually put the science into the spaceship, and now we've got, you know, all kinds of vehicles going on up there. Um, so, and I like putting people together. So I had another friend, Andy Hahn, who I adore. You know Andy. I mean, um, who doesn't know Andy? A lot of people, and they should, but I don't know that he's that available. Um, but, but Andy brought Charlie Colleen to my attention uh, right about the same time. He goes, you, you really, Charlie's a mega musician and thinker and artist. He's won two Grammys, as you know. He's been nominated for seven. Founding member of Train. Founding member of Train. Uh, he is not just the bassist. He's played every instrument on most of those songs, written most of the lyrics, written most of the music. Um, he's a poet. He's a painter. Uh, and I said, okay, well, I'll introduce him to Jim. And, well, Charlie had a band that Stan Frazier was in. It was also a mega star in music, you know, from Sugar Ray and wrote Fly, which ironically was about Stan thinking uh, about suicide. contemplating, yeah. he was contemplating suicide uh, because he just didn't know if they were going to get signed again. Mm -hmm. He was in his 20s. Um, you know, Charlie's had major addiction issues and, and of course it's had to do some total soul searching on the same, same topic. 
you can't be in the music industry without knowing somebody who's killed themselves or has destructed, followed a path of destruction that might as well have been suicide, uh, whether it's alcohol or drug addiction. So then they got together and the magic was just insane. And they wrote a song in 24 to 48 hours. My second husband was a musician. The best song he ever wrote was One Heartbeat for Smokey Robinson with Brian Ray, who went on to play with people like Paul McCartney and people like that. And, and that, that song was written in 48 hours, written and presented to Smokey in 24 hours, 48 hours. Wow. And they were in the studio with it within weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and it crossed over every chart. That, you know, that it happens. Yeah. And that's, that's when you know you've put together some pretty combustible parts. The pawn shop kings who were part of the side deal and Charlie and Stan absolutely together vocally are, you know, beautiful. Yes. You spend all day listening to that. Um, and, and so we went on the road um, and we just, you know, how do you raise money for suicide? Oh, hey, come down to the club. We're going to have lunch for an hour and a half and talk about people killing themselves. It's like, yeah, no, where do you want me to write a check? I'm, I'll, I'll just send a check. I'm, I'm gone that day. So, what you, you know, the old... Um, how do you do something like this? Well, you entertain, you engage, and you educate. Pretty simple marketing strategy. I remember Tom Davin, who was one of my original board members and original board chair, uh, was was uh, has been an executive in many many companies, and not the least of which was a military supply company, also a veteran. And he just said, "Ann, what you're doing? I had no idea. Is you're you're deploying, entertain." engage and educate and these are basic tenets of getting out a message so you're doing just the right thing keep on going here's a check so that's what we're doing COVID kind of threw a little wrinkle in it uh, but I get the guys to do a song probably every month or every six to eight weeks and and uh, at some point maybe we'll start making money off the songs and that'll go into end and of course it'll be a sort of a self-feeding beast yeah but that's the uh, that's the idea it speaks Art has always spoken to humanity, to the human nature that we have. Your heart, your brain engages with your heart. Your one can overpower the other, and here comes Libra again. There's got to be a balance between the two, and when you do, you've got magic. Yeah. And art is very important to that, to our humanity. So I thought it was a good way to approach it. Well, Anne, I usually end the interview by asking, what could we see next from you? But I don't know how to <laughs> fit one more thing on your plate between uh, Rescue California and Angel Disney Wars. Disney Wars. World Peace. Yeah, <laughs> that's like a Miss America Disney pageant. <laughs> yeah, World Peace. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if I was going to try to solve that, you would be the first film call I would make. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's just been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.